World's Last Chance does not set dates. This video presents no specific date for the second coming of Yahushua Messiah, our Savior. None but the Father knows the exact date of the second coming of Yahushua, although we all have been commanded by the Messiah. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Master doth come. Yahushua told the world to watch for his second coming, for the Savior wanted none to be taken by surprise. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Our loving Father Yahuwah has given important prophecies concerning events leading up to the second coming. Revelation 17 stands out as the most important of these prophecies, for its wordage will reveal how close we are to the end of the world and the second coming. This vital chapter speaks of a chronological succession of eight kings. The eighth king's arrival will be the last of these kings, and his end will signal the end of the world and the second coming. Unlocking the identity of the first seven kings and determining which king we are currently living under we will then know, roughly, how close to the Second Coming we are. This important video will show we are within but a few years of the glorious Second Coming of Yahushua Messiah. Let us now go straight to the study of Revelation 17. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahushua. And the angel said unto me, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Let us carefully examine the details of John's vision. 1. John saw a harlot woman in the wilderness, sitting on a fearful-looking beast, drunk from the blood of the saints. This harlot woman was described as the mother of harlots, and was exceedingly rich. 2. The beast carrying the whore had seven heads and ten horns. 3. The angel told John the seven heads of the beast represented seven kings. The seven heads equal seven kings. In vision, the angel took John forward in time to the reign of the sixth king. Thus John was informed that the first five kings were already fallen, that is, they had died, and the seventh king will come 
at the expiration of the office of this sixth king. 4. The reign of the seventh king was forecast to be of short duration in relationship to the present sixth king. After the seventh king, an eighth will arise from the bottomless pit. The angel gave John a riddle. He stated that the eighth king was a beast. Yet he is not currently a beast during the reign of the sixth king. This same beast will emerge again as a beast power and will go to perdition. This enigma is further compounded by the angel when he mentioned to John that the eighth king was one of the seven. Now let us try to understand what this vision is all about. Who is the harlot woman? The word woman in prophecy is commonly used in the scriptures as the symbol of a church group, the ecclesia. A good or pure woman represents the faithful church, while a profligate or adulterous woman represents an impure, compromising, or unfaithful church. A woman equals a church. Which church, then, is represented by the harlot woman of Revelation 17? For over 1,000 years, thoughtful followers of Yahushua have identified the Church of Rome as being the whore of Revelation 17. Prominent Catholics have grudgingly agreed with this interpretation. Bishop Alvaro Palayo confessed 300 years before the Reformation that considering the papal court has filled the whole church with simony and the consequent corruption of religion, it is natural enough the heretics should call the church the whore. Long before the era of the Reformation, Another notable Catholic cardinal and general of the Franciscans, St. Bonaventure, stated in his commentary on the Book of Revelation that Rome was the harlot who makes kings and nations drunk with the wine of her whoredoms. That is, the whore of Revelation 17. All of the reformers, including Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, identified the Roman Catholic Church as the whore of Revelation 17, who sits on seven mountains. Martin Luther himself affirmed the following. We are not the first to declare the papacy to be the kingdom of Antichrist, since for many years before us, so many and such great men whose number is large and whose memory is eternal, have undertaken to express the same thing so clearly and plainly. Having identified the harlot church of Revelation 17, we need to understand what is meant by wilderness to determine when the Roman Catholic Church entered into her wilderness experience. We know from Revelation 12 that when the pure church was persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages for 1260 years, from 538 AD until 1798 AD, it fled to the wilderness. And the woman, true church, fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of Yahuwah, that they should feed her there a thousand and two hundred and threescore days. The wilderness, then, in prophecy, 
is a figure of speech signifying the harsh conditions facing a church in a particular period in her history. Did the Catholic Church enter her wilderness experience just as Yahuwah's true church came out of theirs? Yes, this was exactly the case. In 1798, the Catholic Church not only lost her temporal power over the kings, dukes, and princes of much of Europe, but was in fact no longer free to carry her own ecclesiastical privileges, such as selecting a pope to succeed Pius VI. Her representatives needed the permission of Napoleon Bonaparte before they could appoint Pius VII in 1800 to succeed Pope Pius VI, who died in exile a year earlier in 1799 in Valence, France. From 1798, when Pope Pius VI was banished to Valence by the French general Berthier, up to 1870, when Rome was usurped by the Italian army, the Roman Catholic Church was entrenched in her wilderness experience. This was a far cry from the dominating beast status she had enjoyed during the Middle Ages, when she was the greatest power in Europe, including every king of the Western European empires for hundreds of years. She either directly or through her overpowering influence of European rulers, caused the martyrdom of close to 100 million of Yahuwah's faithful followers. Rome was made the new capital of the Kingdom of Italy in 1861, and finally overtaken in 1870. Pope Pius IX considered himself a prisoner of the Vatican, as it was the only part of Rome not taken over by the Italian troops. It was incomprehensible for the Roman pontiff to be the head of Catholics the world over, yet in his own country be subjected to another head of state. After 1870, Italians found themselves torn between their commitment to the Catholic Church and their allegiance to their newly established country. This unresolved tension between both sides undermined the new country internationally as well as domestically. A solution for the Roman question, the political dispute between the Italian state and the papacy, must be found. In 1922, both Benito Mussolini and Pope Pius XI came to power. By 1929, they had ultimately found a solution to the thorny Roman question. And on February 11, 1929, the Lateran Treaty was signed between Italy and the Holy See. The Italian state recognized the sovereignty of the Catholic Church and regarded the Church as an independent member of the international community. By this agreement, the Church obtained an independent state in Rome with an area of about 44 hectares or 108 and a half acres. The Pope became recognized as the absolute monarch over the Vatican. In 1929, the commencement of the title King, expressed in verse 10 of Revelation 17, was given to the Bishop of Rome for the very first time. The Catholic Church, however, 
is still in its wilderness existence in relation to its status prior to 1798, when she was the beast of the Middle Ages. However, the Lateran Treaty was the best agreement the Church of Rome could obtain to restore the Pope back to his sovereign status. The new king could now travel freely from his Vatican Kingdom to keep his global organization under pontifical scrutiny without the permission of the Italian government. He could now issue his own passport as a sovereign king. In 1929, the Count of the Seven Kings of Revelation 17 commenced. This timeline of kings since the 1929 Lateran Treaty reveals the astounding prophetic news that we have been living under the reign of the seventh king since 2005, when King Pope Benedict XVI acceded to the throne of the Vatican City State. However, his reign is destined to be of a short duration. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. If we exclude the shortest papal reign of 33 days by John Paul I, it would seem that a short space for a pope would be any period between 5 and 10 years. Now let us move on to the eighth king, who will be last pope. The eighth king, pope, will arise from the bottomless pit. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Where is the bottomless pit? The Greek word translated bottomless pit is abusos, which has the English counterpart abyss. The following verses clearly define the abusos. There met him, Yahushua, out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time. And Yahushua asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep, Abusos. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. The bottomless pit is therefore an invisible location established by Yahuwah for the imprisonment of some of the fallen angels. Bottomless pit equals the prison house of the fallen angels. The eighth king, Pope, will not be human, but rather a fallen angel. The prophecy contains another important key in determining the identity of the eighth king. The eighth and final king will also be one of the seven kings. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the Book of Life, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And there are seven kings, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. The angel tells us three times that the beast was, is not, and yet shall be. This is a most important point. The beast was alive, died, and in the future will appear to be alive again. If the eighth king is going to be a fallen angel, 
and also one of the seven kings, then the only logical conclusion is the eighth king will be a fallen angel impersonating one of the former seven kings. Angels have the ability to take on any human form. Which of the seven kings will be impersonated by this fallen angel? We have been given a divine hint of the identity of the king, pope, who will be impersonated by the fallen angel. It will be the sixth king. Did not the angel take John in this vision to the reign of the sixth king? King? And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. The angel made it very easy for us to determine ahead of time which of the seven kings, popes, the eighth was going to impersonate. It is none other than the sixth king, pope, John Paul II. What is so special about John Paul II? Here are 11 important facts concerning John Paul II and his pontificate. Number one, Pope John Paul II was the longest serving Pope of the 20th century with the second longest pontificate in the history of the papacy, 26 and a half years long. He was one of the youngest cardinals ever elected to the papacy and the first non-Italian elected in 455 years. Two, he is credited with being the main instigator of the fall of communism in the former Union of Soviet Socialists Republic. His first trip as the new Pope was to visit his native Poland in 1979 to encourage his homeland with his support for the Solidarity Trade Union Movement which opposed communism in Poland. Ten years later, a peaceful revolution resulted in the downfall of communism in Poland. A few years after that, the Berlin Wall fell and the Cold War ended. 3. During his pontificate, the number of countries having diplomatic relations with the Holy See rose from 85 to 174. 4. John Paul II made 104 trips to 125 foreign countries, more than all the countries visited by all other popes combined. 5. He proclaimed 1,339 people blessed in 143 ceremonies and 483 saints in 52 ceremonies. This was more than the number declared by all the popes in the last 500 years combined. 6. He wrote five books, was fluent in eight languages, and adept in 13 languages. 7. Many people have called him the man of the century. It goes without saying that he was indeed one of the most well-known and most revered men on earth during his pontificate. 8. He is noted as the most important ecumenical and interfaith pope in history. Pope John Paul II was the first pope to visit the Jewish synagogue of Rome, the first pope to visit the Auschwitz Holocaust Memorial, and the first Pope to visit Israel. He forged strong new bonds in Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. 9. His funeral 
brought together the single largest gathering of heads of state outside the UN in history. Four kings, five queens, at least 70 presidents and prime ministers, and more than 14 leaders of other religions attended John Paul II's funeral, which is reckoned by some to have been the largest single gathering of Christianity in history, with numbers estimated in excess of four million mourners gathering in Rome. 10. The beatification of Pope John Paul II, which came six years after his death, is the fastest in Catholic history. On the 19th of December 2009, John Paul II was proclaimed venerable by his successor, Pope Benedict XVI, and was beatified on the 1st of May, 2011. 11. He is the only Pope to have a webcam placed on his grave by the Vatican. Through this webcam, millions of fans around the world can have a virtual pilgrimage to his tomb at any time. We are on the verge of witnessing the mother of all deceptions. All who have not fortified themselves with the truths of Yahuwah's word will be deceived into believing the deceased John Paul II has been resurrected, having been sent from heaven to save the world from the intractable economic crisis that has engulfed planet Earth today. As foretold in prophecy, the reign of the seventh king pope is indeed coming to an end. The first four trumpets of Revelation will soon blast and end before the end of Benedict XVI's reign. We invite you to view the seven trumpets of Revelation video series. The demonically impersonated John Paul II, the eighth king pope, will emerge towards the end of the dreadful fifth trumpet. The reign of the eighth will not be long and will be far shorter than the reign of the seventh king. This we know from the events foretold which will transpire during the reign of the counterfeit John Paul II. This is why we are heralding the good news that the second coming is but a few years away. However, between now and the imminent end, there will be a severe test, splitting the world into two camps, those who are for Yahuwah and those who are against Yahuwah. The seven trumpets of Revelation video series explain in much greater detail the nature of this test. The only way to prepare for this final test is by total daily surrender to Yahuwah's will and the prayerful study of His Word. Only those who are rooted in His Word will be able to endure the coming trial. Are you preparing daily to meet your Savior? Faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. There is no time to waste.